This is Ray Stokes in the oral history section of the library of the Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine on Thursday, July the 9th, with an interview conducted in my office with Dr. George J. Lubel, the co-founder of the Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine and chairman of the board of directors during the college's years as a private institution. Uh, Dr. Lubel has been a general practitioner in Fort Worth since 1946, and he has been active in the political life of his profession, having served as president of the Texas Osteopathic Medical Association in 1950-51, and president of the American Osteopathic Association in 1976-77. Dr. Lubel, we're happy to have you with us today and discuss some of the memoirs of the past. Uh, what was the driving force between 1961 and 1966 that captured your interest in establishing what uh, then was the seventh College of Osteopathy Medicine known as TCOM? Well, Ray, that's hard to say, you know. Sometimes I think it was just pure stupidity that I didn't know enough that it couldn't be done. But um, uh, for several years in Texas, they had had a committee, uh, the State Association, and I'd been a member of it uh, off and on for a long time. I don't remember the dates of it, but uh, they would talk about establishing our own college in Texas. And the annual uh, effort of that committee would usually be to have a 30-minute more or less meeting uh, in somebody's hotel room prior to the mid-year meeting of the Board of Trustees and then report to the Board of Trustees that the committee was still interested in this project. Later on I got to be head of the committee and I really felt that it wasn't ever going to get off the ground probably as a state program. It was something that everybody liked to talk about, but nobody really wanted to take the bull by the horns and and uh, plunge into it. And a lot of that, I think, was due to everybody's lack of experience. And nobody had started a college for uh, good many years. Good many I years, you know, probably, I guess the last college started was the Kirksville College um, that was started in the early 20s and then it later and uh, it later became uh, absorbed or combined with ASO to become the Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine and Surgery which it was when I attended it mm -hmm. and is now the Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine. So uh, until the Michigan people came along and they were of course, uh, um, coming into AOA's uh, House of Delegates, of which I was a member in those days, and the Board of Trustees, which I later became a, um, involved with and be, as a member. And they would have all these uh, 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 slide showings and, and uh, all the propaganda as to what a great uh, deal they were going to run and they were going to build a forty million dollar college. I really always felt that they were trying to build the top story of it first and and uh, they got a grant from AOA and one time when I was on the board why they came back and got another grant uh, from AOA. AOA had some money at that time because the government had gobbled up all their um, um, income from uh, magazines and that sort of stuff and the postal rates weren't so high. So I thought that, I said at the time to the board now, uh, we have a commitment to start a college in Texas and if you're going to give these people money that's fine, I'll vote to give them some money, but I just want to put you all on notice that I'm coming to come back and ask you for some money for the Texas deal uh, someday, so let's just not establish a precedent if you don't want to carry it all the way through. Well, that kind of didn't get a lot of opposition, so um, later on we got into a negotiation 
with the Des Moines College, the College of Physicians and Surgeons in Des Moines. And Des Moines was one of the older Midwestern colleges. It used to be called the Still College of Osteopathy, I think, when I was still a student. And uh, they were, had a, were lodged in an old downtown office building in Des Moines, mm -hmm. and uh, they had a lot of land uh, on a uh, old military reservation, the old Fort Des Moines reservation out there. And they were talking about moving out of downtown onto that property out there where they'd built a little clinic. Or maybe they ought to just move uh, clear out of Des Moines since they weren't getting much support and they'd had some restrictions in the past in the Iowa law and, and uh, they were just kind of living from hand to mouth. So uh, we got in to talking with them and in touch with them and I can't remember how it was, probably at some AOA meeting and we invited them to come down and look at Fort Worth here as a possible place to move the school instead of across town, clear across several states. I, and they made two or three visits down here and in the course of the conversation uh, one of the deans suggested that uh, how would we operate or how would they operate down here without having a Texas charter. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, we can get a charter if that's all the problem is, you know, with you. I really never did figure that they would move because I thought that when the people in Des Moines got wind of the fact that they were losing a rather stable institution that had been around for, oh, since the early part of the century, we were certainly going to do something to keep it there. They did, and Des Moines didn't move, and unfortunately for Des Moines, they didn't twist the local arms hard enough to get enough money out of them to make it worthwhile to stay. I think they could have done better than they did. But in the meantime, I talked to Mr. Herman about the problem of getting a charter and how much it would cost, and he told me that some, which was not astronomical, and that he could have to make a trip to Austin to get such a charter approved. And I felt that uh, uh, we ought to go ahead and get a charter and have it in hand because I felt that if we announced our intention of going to Austin and securing a charter, we might suddenly get all kinds of uh, roadblocks put against us by the allopathic profession to name names. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and we might have a lot of difficulty because it turned out that uh, instead of uh, states like New York, I had sat in on a meeting with New York and they had to have $300,000 worth of assets before the state would give them a charter and I think Michigan had to have 100000 but we didn't have any monetary consideration in Texas to get a charter. So I was sitting talking to my wife one night and I said, you know, uh, I just wonder who I could get to go in with me on a deal like that. And I thought a few minutes, I said, I know I believe who will do that. And I called up two friends of mine and told them that I wanted so much money from each one of them mm -hmm. and for what purpose. And they said, well, okay, I think you're crazy, but all right, we'll do it. And that was uh, Dr. D.D. D. Byer and Dr. Carl Everett. Right. So the three of us contributed the... Uh, six hundred dollars or so of expense money and sent Mr. Herman down to uh, Austin and he came back with a charter which uh, was one of the most liberal documents ever okayed by the Secretary of State of this <laughs> the great state of Texas right. and it enabled us to go in business running a medical school and running a nursing school and all kinds of other allied health schools that we wanted to. So. Uh, now that we had the thing, what were we going to do about it? Well, it soon we soon found out that Des Moines, as I suggested earlier, backed out of their deal. They weren't coming, so if we were going to have a college, we were going to have to have one of our own. And uh, one time when I was in San Antonio, I came back through Austin and wanted to see the commissioner on higher education to talk about this thing and find out what the uh, problems we might run into with the state in an educational way. 
So the commissioner was out of pocket, but I talked to his assistant who later became commissioner in another state and really didn't know much about us, though he had come there from one of the western states. But he uh, said in a moment of uh, a, a candid moment, he said, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but he said, I think if you are going to start a college, you ought to start a college. And then if you want any state support, come and try to get it afterwards. He said, my idea of observing medical politics in this state, which I had a first-hand observation recently to do, was that if you come down there and try to get for state funds to start your school, you're going to be 10 years ever getting off the launching pad. And Who I, was the commissioner at that time? Oh, remember his name? Oh, the commissioner was the same one we dealt with uh, all yeah. the time and became Somebody, another. His name slips. Yeah, memory. he became very friendly with right. us, right. and sure, uh, yeah. uh, he wasn't the man I talked to. That man later went to Missouri and became uh, commissioner of educa higher education up there. And I told him later on that I didn't introduce him to some of my friends in Missouri. He said, look, your friends are enough trouble here in Texas. I don't want to know your Missouri friends. <laughs> but uh, oh, this tall gentleman, he always looked like Dr. Everett Wilson of San Antonio. He had uh, and he's, oh, he's since retired. Um, but uh, he, uh, he was a great help to us uh, when we later went before the uh, uh, board of uh, higher education. So that's really how we got into it and then we having got the charter we went up and uh, I uh, asked the AOA board to grant us $25,000. I said we needed some walking around money. <laughs> so they gave us they agreed to give us the $25,000 but we only took down five of it so we figured we still had a $20,000 credit and then President John Hayes um, got up before the board during his uh, administration and said that that shouldn't be given to us because we were hadn't used it and uh, they didn't have that much loose money laying around. Well, the board had a recess and several of my colleagues from Pennsylvania and and Michigan and all gathered around and said, uh, and Missouri said, well, what are you going to do about that? I said, we got to have that other $20,000. So they said, well, now we're going back in and we're going to move to reconsider that act. And they moved to reconsider it and, and passed it over Hayes' objection. So I left town with uh, the AOA's check for $20,000 and we immediately put it in the bank for a national bank here right. so that they couldn't get it back. And that was probably the money we hired you with originally. That's part of the story I hadn't heard. Yeah. I mean, I knew about the 20000 but Well, that's, that's, what we, that's the 20000 we almost didn't get. You know? yeah. So... Dr. Lubel, I understand that the Texas Association pledged uh, about a hundred thousand dollars during, I think it was the 1967 convention. Now I know that that just didn't happen. You had to have done your homework well, and as I understand, the smoke, the uh, the snowball was rolling. So what happened that caused kind of a delay in reviving the enthusiasm that was generated during the Houston convention? Well, it wasn't altogether a, uh, a deflation of the project. Uh, what really happened, uh, as I recall it, is that we went down to Houston and actually made a pitch to the membership to see what their uh, reaction would be um, about this college they'd always talked about having if they would really support it with money. The state association itself never had the money to run a college or to to finance a college or to get one off the ground even. So we had to ask the membership, and it was not the state association as an official body, but the members that were present, we had some cards printed up to let them 
uh, indicate what their feelings were toward it and if they would pledge money toward it and if so how much and so it amounted to about a hundred thousand dollars most of which incidentally never was collected I mean we might have got the hundred thousand dollars but uh, probably as your records will show over half of the people that pledged at Houston never pledged anything at all we right. talked about it again next year here in Fort Worth when the convention was here and uh, the enthusiasm for really uh, shelling out any money for the project was, uh, I think, more noticeable by its absence than by its presence. Um, and of course, one of the problems with it is that we didn't have any uh, real tangible assets that we could show. Uh, we were still pretty much, you might say, a shadow organization. You had an office and uh, I don't know whether Dr. Hart was then with us or not. He came, I came in April, he came the following October. Yes, but uh, you know we didn't have any bricks and mortar no. and we didn't have a place to uh, really put this thing. And uh, then we later went on to the Lubbock meeting, and by that time, Dr. Everett had had a, a real uh, uh, specific money-raising campaign, which he called the, what, the Thousand Dollar Club, mm -hmm. and, right. and he was uh, persuading people to, to actually donate a thousand dollars. That's right. And right. that's so uh, we got about eighteen or twenty thousand yeah. uh, dollars one yeah. one day. Out yeah, there. and uh, it, well, that was in May, I think, of nineteen seventy. Yeah, and uh, of course uh, he also then uh, persuaded the uh, uh, chairman of the board of the uh, Fort Worth Osteopathic Hospital to, and this was not at the same time. This was. Uh, well, I guess it, it, since we opened in October and May, he must have done it prior to that time because it was in the winter time that he went out to Dr. Russell's house and persuaded uh, him that we should be able to use the fifth floor of the hospital uh, for this purpose if we uh, modern, uh, modernized it or uh, finished it off ourselves because mm -hmm. it was an unfinished floor. Right. And um, actually the hospital board went ahead and agreed to that and that's why. Now was that before the Lubbock uh, meeting or after? It must have been before the Lubbock meeting. In other words, we knew pretty well what we our direction yeah. uh, were uh, yeah. when we went to Lubbock. Yeah, we knew that uh, we uh, had some uh, space to start in and we didn't, we uh, also uh, you know, arranged, and I don't know whether it was at that time or slightly later, we arranged to use for that house across the street from what was then the ambulance entrance to the hospital. Well, we had, uh, that's where we were when we went to Lowe. Yeah. We so moved there already, in February 1970. Yeah, we had already, and so that all must have taken place, you know, at the same time during that uh, winter before we went to Lubbock in the spring. Mm -hmm. for that meeting. Right. Otherwise you wouldn't have been in the house and we wouldn't have known that we were going to uh, have access to the fifth floor of the hospital. Right. There wouldn't have been no real need to be that closely identified with the physical layout of the hospital. No. Okay. Um, we might have kept our office down in the uh, 15 Malik, west, uh, Yeah, across from the Malik Tower right, there. Right. But uh, Um, really the the meeting in Lubbock then was the first real hard and fast um, a pitch to the whole convention where we asked for real money and not just uh, uh, vague promises that were uh, not nailed down to anything. Uh, Dr. Lubel uh, I know that you encountered many well-intended critics and maybe even a few adversaries, uh, but tell me, if you will, of one or more experiences 
that were considered stumbling blocks rather than stepping stones. For example, uh, we've been talking about Lubbock, your experience during the 1970 Toma Convention in Lubbock. Well, of course, uh, there were people who didn't think we could ever run this thing, and there were people who thought we didn't know anything uh, about uh, running a college, and uh, there were people who were sure they could run it better than us uh, if uh, such a thing ever did come about. Actually, I had two experiences in Lubbock that were uh, more painful than uh, uh, encouraging. Mm -hmm. The first time I ever went to Lubbock, uh, I went uh, to Amarillo and then to Lubbock. Oh, you went to for district the, meetings for out district there. district meetings mm -hmm. out there. Yeah. And, you know, uh, we were having it at somebody's house. I think it was Dr. Gene Brown's house. And some one of the local doctors who pontificated a great deal. And when I got through talking, he thought the whole idea was ridiculous that us, peoples didn't know, us people didn't know any more about running a college and we did run about run a filling station and why should he put money into something like that? And I informed him that really we didn't know anything about running a filling station either. If we bought a filling station we'd hire a guy who knew how to run a filling station to run it and we didn't expect to run a college and uh, we never did run the college. We always brought in That seemed to people. be the hardest thing to put across during well, those early days. Yeah, you know one of the things I found out about in dealing with my professional brethren that uh, they have a, a lot of tunnel vision in their educational background. I mean they're educated to talk about people's diseases and all but they're not near as expert on problems away from the field of medicine even the management of medical institutions as they think they are. And um, I had had the advantage of sitting on uh, not only the Texas uh, Osteopathic Medical Association's board for many years, but also the AOA one. And I'd been a member of a college alumna board, which met with the board of that college. And I had a lot of exposure to how a lot of these things mm -hmm. were operated more than they did. And I'd heard college reports, I'd even gone out and on an inspection team for a college at one time and there was a lot of things I uh, was aware of and it always amazed me how um, limited a lot of these people were in their uh, uh, approach to things and their knowledge of the thing. I think they always oversimplified the idea of locating the college in Arlington. Uh, that it was the doctors in Fort Worth and the doctors in Dallas could both come right over there and do all the teaching mm -hmm. and yet there wasn't any hospital to teach in, there wasn't any uh, place to house or feed anybody and the, uh, the location we finally ended up with was so far away from the toll road that anybody from Dallas could get into the area where the school finally ended up quicker than he could if he tried to go to Arlington. So uh, then in the in the convention in Lubbock, why I had a, I guess you would call it a head knocking with Dr. Bobby Smith who um, didn't seem to think that I could, uh, or my colleagues could run the thing probably as good as he could or, or that we could even uh, make a go of it if it opened up. So. Uh, and of course he wanted me to make some impossible guarantees that I couldn't make and nobody could make and the chairman of the meeting finally pointed out to him that nobody could do anything like that so why didn't we quit talking about it that way. But unfortunately I think we came away from the Lubbock meeting while with a lot of support but we had a small hardcore of dissentants who never were satisfied with the way TCOM was opened up and run and uh, um, they really never did support it. In fact, unfortunately, uh, some of them seemed to snipe at it all the time it was in existence as a private school and uh, 
I don't know why they felt that way or because uh, it wasn't their idea originally and they didn't do all the background work and spade work to get it off the ground and uh, none of those things can run without uh, a lot more effort than meets the eye. Dr. Lubel, I've said several times that the three main reasons for our success were attributable to the contribution of Dr. Henry B. Hart, our first dean, the act that was passed by the Texas legislature based on a prior bill known as the Baylor Medical Bill, and the Arlington land that was given to us by the Vandergrifts. Uh, please tell me your reaction to my choices. Uh, for example, what is your thinking on this particular subject? Well, I think the first thing you mentioned, Dr. Hart, was of course uh, one of our uh, really great acquisitions. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Hart, uh, having been in the academic world, knew how to go about the mechanics of uh, recruiting uh, faculty and organizing it uh, together. None of us knew how to do that. We didn't know where uh, to acquire uh, people with doctorate degrees in the various basic sciences or who could teach the basic science subjects, but he did and he got those people together. And he had academic prestige. He'd been president of the National Intercollegiate Athletic Con uh, uh, Association. Not which, once, but twice. But twice, mm -hmm. which includes all the major colleges. Of course, he'd had a long career as professor and uh, department head of the Department of Chemistry at TCU. And he knew a lot of people locally. He was highly respected. And then, uh, more than anything else uh, that uh, I appreciated was the fact that he plunged into this thing with a great deal of enthusiasm and uh, devotion to it and he was able to go to the various meetings at, uh, among the osteopathic collegiate world in the AOA and represent us with dignity and poise and uh, uh, as an, uh, with an academic background. And he would speak uh, around to the various professional organizations or civic organizations and he had more enthusiasm and all for a man his age than uh, most of uh, my colleagues who were listening to him at in various places of the country. So I think he was a, a real gem that we uncovered and found and uh, I don't think we could have... Uh, we can certainly thank Dr. Jerome Moore out of yeah, TCU for putting us on to that lead. Well, we, we might have found somebody else that could have done it uh, equally as well, but I don't know that we'd ever find anybody that could have done it better. And so uh, that was, that's what I think about Dr. Hart. I, I admired him ever since I became acquainted and associated with him, and my admiration still persists. Uh, my only regret about Dr. Hart today is that his health is poor. But uh, of course, the uh, the Vandergriff uh, land deal was something I always had mixed emotions about. I understood that the Vandergriffs were, of course, uh, giving us that piece of land in that location because the utilities had to be brought all across all their other land to our land and they were going to benefit by it, which I didn't object to. Uh, I, there was no reason for them to give it away unless they could get some benefit from it. But the only problem with that land is that we never really would have title to it. It had a clause in it that if it was ever, if we ever ceased to use it for educational purposes, uh, it would revert to them and their heirs. Mm -hmm. Now, I can understand that they weren't going to give it to us and let us turn around and sell it, you know, in a, in a few years. But if they would have said that at the end of 20 years or so uh, that we would obtain a clear title to the land, I would have had a much better right. feeling about it because otherwise, no matter what investment we put on it, if 
it turned out that this was not right for us, that we couldn't, for reasons of, uh, of facilities or hospital connections or anything else or community support or any of a myriad bunch of reasons or inaccessibility for the rest of the profession. couldn't afford to be in a position where we had uh, money tied up in uh, buildings or equipment uh, that was difficult to move or that we couldn't recoup our investment in any way. So that I never did think and uh, it, it was really much more isolated at the time, I'm sure, than it is now. With oh, the yes. growth of Arlington, and I'm sure that it's all been used up by now. But who could foresee that that growth would uh, go that way and go that way that rapidly in that time of uh, our career? If we could foresee things like that, we'd all be rich. We would have bought, uh, speculated in every direction at the right time. Might have even been able to endow the college if we'd known that much. So. Uh, it, it finally came to a pass that we had to return that uh, uh, land to the Vandegrift since we were, it was obvious that we never were going to use it. And uh, I always felt that regardless of that land deal that the location in Fort Worth that was finally settled upon and where the college is today is the place that all we should have been and I'm glad to see that it ended up there because uh, Fort Worth is the only major city in the state without a medical school or a professional school. I never had a professional school, uh, or let me back up and say it had had professional schools, but they'd all gone out of existence 50 years ago. And they, they even were, had a med school back in 1900. School. Yeah, well, it, it didn't go out of existence until at the end of World War I, and why I never understood. But anyway, this was the fact of life. So that uh, uh, we were the only major city in the state that didn't have a, a, an ongoing professional school. The only thing we had was uh, seminaries and barber colleges. <laughs> but, so I felt that um, we could get more legislative support for something like this than if we tried to put it in Dallas, Houston, or San Antonio. We had the biggest hospital, we had the biggest collection of, of uh, specialty physicians in one area for possible teaching purposes. And if we located where we did, we had a public campus across from us in the museum complex that uh, we would never have to build, right. even though some of them don't like us as well now, since we uh, build up to the point where their medical friends don't appreciate us. But uh, uh, I think ending up where we did. Now I was aware for some time, of course, that Baylor had uh, gotten a law passed Baylor Medical College, that Dental was in College, I yes, uh, which uh, would uh, allow the coordinating board to contract with them for the education of bona fide Texas residents. Uh, but that law never was funded the first go around by the legislature, so Baylor didn't actually get any money the first time around. And but being the law was in existence, I felt that we had a valid uh, reason to go down and ask for the same thing. Right. And uh, particularly then after they funded Baylor and we went down there and that thing was managed with the assistance and really through the, uh, uh, not with the assistance of it, it was, it was actually managed by the Texas uh, Osteopathic Medical Association and Dr. Smith, who I alluded to earlier, in spite of our differences at Lubbock, uh, he was the um, legislative representative for TOMA in Austin, and he worked hard to handle this and get it through. And we finally convinced the legislature that they should give 
TCOM some money for the same type of deal. Now they really didn't give us the same amount of money or the same type of deal that Baylor got. In fact, they only gave us $150,000 a year for the first year, which with uh, 20 students, why uh, that wasn't uh, hardly $10,000 a piece, you know, about $8,000 a piece. But um, fortunately, Governor Briscoe redlined the whole half of the uh, biennial budget whole second half of it, so he had to have a special session to create a budget for the second uh, half of the uh, biennium. Mm -hmm. And we went back down to Austin and appeared before the board, and by that time we had uh, run a year with our $150,000, and we were growing a little bit, and we hadn't spent it unwisely or foolishly. So they gave us $300,000 for the next year. So, you know, we made $150,000 on the deal. Right. And uh, so really we were getting more money for the state with even that so-called pittance uh, per capita than other states were who, other state osteopathic schools who were bragging about how much they were getting because Pennsylvania was the only one getting any of it on a routine basis and they were getting four or five thousand dollars a year and so when we ended up before we became a private school that thing amounted to twelve thousand um, dollars a year for bona fide Texas resident students so it came out very good and uh, we were able to use some of our other monies to uh, consolidate our um, financial position to pay off our debts and to buy up some of the property around us so that when this thing was turned over as a state school we had about three million dollars worth of assets as I recall. I think so. And while it wasn't it, was, it wasn't three million dollars worth of vacant land like most of these colleges that came into the state with they didn't have a farm at the edge of some town that they were going to build a college on or had built a college on. We had to persuade the legislators that this was not a bad deal for the state because a medical school has to be in the middle of town anyway and somebody in the middle of town with three million dollars worth of assets was better off maybe than a college out, a liberal arts college out on the edge of some town with 50 or 100 acres of farmland. Yeah, if memory serves me right, we own this 3,500 square block that is, you know, from uh, yeah. Bowie to Madison and Montgomery down to Clifton, yeah. plus the one lot that's now houses the uh, Tarrant County Medical uh, Examiner's Office. We own that lot and the square block, and that's what we owned at the time. But we own the building on that oh, lot. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Sure. And we own the yeah. bowling alley building. Right. We and own we own the motel building next to right. us. Right, right. I didn't mean and we, we had property yeah. on there. It wasn't all just yeah. raw land. So we also own the go go joint and the liquor store. Right. We made a mistake. <laughs> we should have kept the liquor store in business until we uh, became a state school. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, what other questions do you have? Dr. Lubel, with reference uh, to the gift of the Arlington land that we've been discussing, the things that uh, led up to our returning the land to its previous owners, uh, Carlisle Craven and the Vandergriffs, uh, seem to have been distorted by some critics. Uh, will you clarify this and explain the exact happenings that prompted that action? Well, I don't know what you mean exactly by distorted or what the nature of this distortions were. Um, I had talked to Mr. Vandergriff uh, Jr., who um, stage managed this whole thing anyway, and of course he was then mayor of Arlington and trying to promote the city of Arlington, for which uh, I uh, could appreciate and, uh, and felt that that was uh, uh, valid duty on his part. As a matter of fact, I, I'm very fond of Mr. Vandergrift. I think he's a 
a great guy, and I think he did an awful lot for the city of Arlington. That probably and Tarrant all, County and Tarrant well, County. Right. That probably that most of the people now living in Arlington don't understand, but uh, and for which he'll never get any credit. But it became obvious that after we got established here, and that we were getting the bulk of our teaching um, service uh, and uh, the bulk of our uh, usage for student uh, teaching and all from Fort Worth Osteopathic Hospital, that the volunteers in this area were the mainstay of our uh, faculty as far as the clinical people were concerned, that uh, there wasn't any money around, Mr. Vandergriff didn't know of any uh, at all, where we could put any suitable facilities on that land and out there. We didn't have any money. We had, as you know, uh, the first year we used the uh, bowling alley building while well, we got a grant from the Carter Foundation to pay for the uh, rent on that and then finally um, we made a deal to take over the building and uh, pay on it and uh, so it, we were here and since a lot of the and after a lot of the people came to Fort Worth for the convention, um, the second year I think we were in that bowling alley building or the first year, you remember we had a party for them right. in that building and brought them all out there yeah, on was buses. Seventy two, I believe. I believe in seventy two is about the third year the college was running. And they were amazed at how much how good a facility we had and how much space we had and all around there. So uh, actually, by and large, the hue and cry of moving to Arlington or having out of Arlington pretty well died down with the majority of the profession. They felt that we were doing better where we were, and so we finally uh, had heard uh, kind of rumors from the uh, Vandegrift people and all that if we weren't going to use that land, why we ought to relinquish it. So. We instructed Mr. Uh, Herman to talk to Carlisle Craven, since they were both attorneys and mm -hmm. knew each other well, about us just uh, giving them back the land and them uh, accepting a, a um, deed of returning or whatever formal legal papers were made. And the board of the college uh, approved that idea, and uh, there were several elements on the board who thought it should be done so that's how it ended up and that's what we did and uh, gave it back since we couldn't use it. So by the time we applied to uh, the state for money to run TCOM and later on when we were turning the institution over to the state uh, that Vandergriff land was not in the picture as one of our assets or carried in any way on our books. Mm -hmm. Well, fine. I appreciate getting that uh, cleared up uh, because I had heard other discussions about various and sundry reasons as to why. Well, I'm sure you heard all kinds of reasons, but you know, uh, I, I would uh, surmise that some of the people that were um, telling you about it uh, had the most incomplete knowledge of the whole problem. Well, that, that's it exactly. <laughs> You know, that's what always happens. And they never go, uh, they never go and ask somebody. I remember one time we were, uh, Dr. Hart came to me all perplexed and he had a letter that somebody had given him. And one of the fellows that one of the doctors around that uh, had uh, desires to teach uh, had written this letter to somebody else over in the Dallas area telling them that he sure would like to teach, uh, teach at TCOM but uh, that he understood that none of those people would have anything to do with anybody outside and they wouldn't let you into teach there anyway and uh, what was he going to do about it and all and the letter I guess the other doctor turned the letter over to Dr. Hart and I said, well why don't you just write this guy and tell him to tell his friend that he could find out more information if he came over to TCOM and talk to you about the whole subject than he could going through three or four people that 
didn't know the facts. Right. Right. And those, those were examples. We had a lot of comparable experiences uh, yeah. like that during the first initial yeah, years. We, we, um, and that's one of the things I think that anybody who's starting a medical school or who's running a medical school in the osteopathic profession always has to live with. I remember when I was in Kirksville, they, they always had rumors about how the place was running or wasn't running or should run. And I said to Morris Thompson one day when he was still president of Kirksville, or was, I was writing him a letter about something that he'd asked about. I said, you know, if you could ever get the Kirksville rumor mill quieted down, I think your job of president would be a lot easier up there. <laughs> he agreed. You know, when we were running our uh, funding drive here and had the thousand uh, dollar club and had people contribute into that, right. um, Dr. Thompson became very much concerned about his 750 club in Kirksville because some of the contributors in Texas had uh, fallen off. So he sent uh, Dr. Russell uh, out around to uh, uh, survey all this stuff. And you remember the I story. Sure you remember how sure they, were, they were telling uh, Dr. Thompson in Kirksville that they had to quit giving to Kirksville because they were given to the Texas College. And when Phil came back with that information, we got the books out and showed him they're not giving to us either. They're just lying to both sides. That's right. And that's what I'm they were still doing. looking for. Some of that. Yeah, they they didn't give us any money, and they they were using that excuse to keep Morris from getting his money. I, I've never ceased to be amazed at some of the pocketbook protection schemes we ran into. <laughs> Just Correct. wait till you open and then come to see me. Yes, yes, and I'll give you the money. <laughs> uh, you know, Dr. Lubel talking about versions of various and sundry things that happened. Uh, there have been several versions of just how and why TCOM first became identified with uh, North Texas State University. Uh, will you give your recollection of what actually transpired that made us now part of the state system? Well, one of the things that uh, uh, stimulated uh, any type of affiliation uh, with a uh, major university was when the coordinating board uh, came up here to, uh, or, or sent a committee up here to look at us before they finally made an agreement to contract with us after the legislature had passed the law. And they were really going to snow us down on that. They were going to have experts come in from all over the country. And there would have been more experts than there were student body and faculty put together. Well, we finally got some of that uh, scuttled. And uh, they ended up with, they only brought one guy down from Chicago from the AMA, but Dr. Brindley from Scott and White came up here heading the thing. And they, we had this whole thing conducted over in the hospital dining room, and uh, finally, among the last things that were said, this man from Chicago, and I can't remember his name, he was the director of medical education for AMA, and he said, well, he said, I, I really don't think that this is the right way to start a medical school, and I never really heard of starting a medical school this way, but uh, the more I've heard the story, I, if I'd have been like you guys, I think I'd have gone ahead and done it the same way you did. I don't think there's any other way you could have done it. And Bren Brenly said that they were going to recommend that the coordinating board uh, um, contract with us, but, they th but he thought, and they would recommend to the board, that uh, TCOM should have some sort of an affiliation with a major university in the area. Well, Mr. Vandegrift had told me that he'd already sounded out the president at UTA, and uh, they were totally disinterested, and they, they wouldn't even talk about the subject. And we later realized, uh, he later left there, that man, and became president of U the University of Texas Medical School at San Antonio. Right can't think of his name but either. the current right. president is also an MD, isn't he? I don't know whether he is or not, Dr. Neisler or Neidler. I don't know whether he's an MD or a PhD. But anyway, the man 
who was there had come from the University of Tennessee Medical School and then he went off down to San Antonio and got back in being a medical school president. But, uh, you know, we were really clued into this then by the coordinating board and some other knowledgeable people that none of these units of the University of Texas system compete against each other. They don't do that. They have coordinated things and each of them has their own sphere of activity. So with a medical school 15 miles away from UTA in Dallas, they weren't about to try to compete to get involved with a medical school uh, over here, especially when uh, uh, Southwestern Medical School had a contract over here at Peter Smith Hospital. So, and the private colleges, TCU wasn't going to take on anything like that because a medical school is a very expensive uh, money-losing problem uh, for a private mm -hmm. institution to take on. So uh, TWC and, uh, and the TCU were out of the picture. And I had always thought that the logical target was North Texas because they had their own separate board of regions, whereas a lot of these others like UTA where they were you had to go through the University Board of Regents at Austin, which is a very difficult thing to do, right? Um, well, anyway, Dr. Sylvie went to Hawaii to the... Now, Dr. Sylvie, who is Dr. Doctor, Sylvie? Well, Dr. Sylvie was the head of the biological department at, at North Texas State University. Dr. Gwen Sylvie. Yeah. J.K.G. Sylvie. J.K.G. Sylvie. J. K. G. Sylvie. Yeah, right. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Better known as Gwen. Yeah. And he went over there to lecture to the general practitioners meeting at the AOA convention in Hawaii, the year that was Mary, Dr. Marion Coy's presiding convention. And he was the president during that convention. And um, I think Dr. Um, Bob, uh, the Texas past president who lives in Denton. Uh, oh, Noble. Dr. Robert Nobles, yeah. Uh, he uh, uh, and Dr. Sylvie talked about this, you know, and, uh, and talked about uh, uh, some of our aspirations, and he got a better first hand look at the at the uh, profession, and then he came back and talked to Dr. C. C. Nolan, Jitter Nolan, who was president of the university, and said, maybe we ought to take a look at this thing, or get together with him. So Dr. Nobles conveyed some of this to me, and, and we arranged for uh, uh, him to uh, come down and, uh, and bring uh, uh, Dr. Nolan and Dr. Sylvie down and let's talk about it. So um, we met over at Colonial Country Club for dinner and uh, Dr. Uh, and Stanley, that was at my expense. Anytime I went to Colonial, I signed a darn checks for those things and nobody <laughs> ever gives me credit for them. Oh my <laughs> but, but I had Mr. Harry Worst meet with us yeah. and you know, he, he knew Jitter at uh, at TCU right. and um, Dr. Henry Hart as the dean. So we uh, talked about this idea and about maybe working out some sort of a, really what we were talking about was a lend-lease program where we could rent or lease some of their facilities and some of their faculty to give us some instant bricks and mortar for uh, the use in our basic science program in the first two years. And they had some extra space up there and all, and so they had a lot of stuff. And, and then we had another meeting over in Dallas uh, at one of those uh, clubs on one of the tall buildings with Bob Sharp and his wife and, and uh, um, the Burnettes were there. And, Dr. And, John and Mary Burnett. Yeah, and all the wives were there. And, Jitter and the Sylvies came down to that one, and uh, 
this fellow, Gene, uh, what was Gene's last name that later came over here and worked for the college? The Kiefer. The Kiefer, yeah, he was there. So, um, so the atmosphere was that we really ought to try to um, get together on some of these things. So they assigned uh, Dr. Hart, you know, to work with Dr. Gus Perret and see what they could work out. So then when we had the next board meeting, while well, we had this thing, program all lined out, and, uh, and we said, now what we want to do is uh, take you all up to uh, Denton, we rented a bus, we want to take you all up to Denton Sunday morning, these people will be there and they'll show you the facilities, they'll tell you what our deal is, and you can approve it or not, you know. Well. Of course, most of them were impressed, most of them wanted to go along with it, but we had quite an argument coming back on the bus about this thing, because some of the... Uh, now that was your board of directors. This was the board of directors of TCOM, TCO. yeah, but a couple of them, well, of course, uh, a couple of people from the state association that were in on the uh, trip and all, but were not members of the board. They had some uh, misgivings about it, and one of the members on the board was rather vociferous about it, that we just wanted them to come in and rubber stamp the thing. Well, we said, they don't want you to rubber stamp it. We think it's a good idea. We think you should approve it, but we're going to have a vote. You vote. If you don't like it, vote against it. If you got a better idea, you better come up with it if you're going to turn this one down. At that time, I think the, the board consisted of about nine or ten members, I believe. Yeah. So um, they finally voted to make the deal, and actually we got a deal that was uh, really a steal that first year. It wasn't, uh, North Texas couldn't come out money-wise on the thing, but we added a little more to it when we got some of our money from the state. And so that thing stayed in effect until, um, gee, it was just two years ago, wasn't it, that it finally they got all the students down here from Denton? Yes, yeah, been a little over two years. A little over two years. It gave us a, a it, it was a very, it was inconvenient. It wasn't an ideal arrangement for, our, and it separated our student body more than we realized it was going to, and that the freshmen and sophomores really didn't meet the juniors and seniors enough. But they don't now. The juniors and seniors are out all over hell and half of Georgia, and nobody knows where they are. And the, Freshmen and sophomores don't see them anyway, but um, uh, I think, and it gave the impression that we were part of North Texas State University. So when we went down to Austin then to uh, work for um, st full state support and make TCOM a full state support school. Uh, it was with the uh, approval of and the aggressive uh, help from North Texas State University. They kept their, uh, they don't have a lobbyist, but they have a, a representative who gives information mm -hmm. to the legislature. Right, right. <laughs> who is an, somebody's administrative assistant. And they kept him down in Austin working on it all the time, and our own people worked on it, the state people worked on it. And it finally came about. And uh, I think it's the best thing because I don't see how we could sit in an eight story building and listen to them build another one on private funds anymore. It's almost impossible. Dr. Lubel, one of the first assignments that you gave me when I was first employed by the school was to pursue the possibility of uh, rekindling the, uh, an interest that had been given to the school at one time through a letter of intent by a local oil man, a doc, uh, Mr. Howard Walsh. Uh, he had given a letter of intent, as I understand, uh, to the school, possibly giving as much as 60 acres of land out in northwest Tarrant County where at the moment I think the uh, northwest uh, campus of the Texas uh, College of Junior College of Tarrant County is uh, located. 
Uh, I was unable to have any luck with getting that interest revived, but could you uh, add to uh, some something that I might not be familiar with uh, about uh, how you got the letter in the first place and uh, what uh, actually happened? Well, we first got interested in some property out there because there was a ranch that was basically on the south side of that uh, lake property of that little lake there. This case is a separate problem. It has to be run by medical educators, but uh, public relations is sure something that nobody ever has too much of. Good public relations, that is. Right. You can get bad ones that you have too much of. That I was given when I came to work here was to try to uh, take a uh, letter of intent that uh, had been given to TCOM by a oil man here and his family, uh, J. Howard Walsh. He had given uh, the school a, a letter of intent that he might give 60 acres of land or thereabouts out in northwest Tarrant County, where one of the local, uh, where Tarrant County Junior College Northwest Campus, I think, is now located. And I made a concerted effort to try to revive an interest on their part and that had been some year, year and a half uh, before that he had made the tentative offer. Uh, can you add any enlightenment as to what actually happened in that uh, instance? Well, my recollection isn't too precise altogether either, Ray, but we really got interested in that territory when uh, a son-in-law of the people that owned that ranch on the south side of that lake and went all the way along and was all on the west side of Meacham Field there and I can't recall offhand the name of that ranch uh, but uh, anyway we looked at that thing and then I don't remember whether Mr. Walsh acquired part of that property later on and then he kind of gave us a rather nebulous uh, letter about keeping up the interest in that. Then he turned the problem over to his sons and we never were really able to communicate with the sons or sit down and talk to them and they kind of brushed the whole thing off so I never did know uh, if they were influenced by some outside interest that didn't want us to have the thing or whether they had a better offer or whether they were only interested in getting something there out there like the junior college that would call, cause it would develop more traffic and and people out there than we would of course. Then you don't really know what prompted Mr. Walsh to give the letter of intent in the first place? I don't recall, no. And um, of course we looked at a bunch of other locations, you know. we. Uh, and we had a lot of people that were interested in helping us look at them and really trying to figure out a way to finance them because we didn't have any money. Right. Uh, we looked at the old medical arts building and we looked now at that. Now that was back even before I was employed. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. I read some of the information yeah. about that. I think you had Larry Mills from a AOA. Yeah, I look at it. Down. And of course we decided that uh, even if we could have acquired the thing because TCU owned it, it had been given to them. Um, it would never have been practical for use because the medical arts building was set up as a doctor's building and the elevators ran right up the middle of it and all the offices were uh, around uh, within close proximity to this elevators but uh, it didn't leave any wide enough space to ever set up a classroom of any size in the whole building. Then we looked at the property out on South uh, Riverside Drive where the um, uh, Children's Rehabilitation uh, uh, Center was originally. They're down now uh, next to Harris Hospital on 7th Street. They mm -hmm. built that new place. Yeah. We looked at that place, which had uh, once, I believe, also been an orphanage uh, or some sort of a school before they took it over. And it wouldn't have been bad. It would have been a pretty good uh, 
layout for us, adequate property-wise, to start in and, and room to build on. Now we looked at the uh, church down here that the sons of Frank Norris had promoted down there yeah. at Summit and First West, Baptist. West 7th mm -hmm. Street. Uh, and um, that, it was a big Baptist church. There. I think we came within about a million dollars uh, negotiating for that. <laughs> they yeah. wanted about a million more than... <laughs> yeah, but also they finally did sell it to somebody because oh, they yeah. got out over their head with that thing. Right. And uh, well, you know that wouldn't have been a bad place either. You, no. take, you take the uh, the uh, cross off the top. What am I trying to say? Uh, and uh, put a caduceus uh, up there instead, and you're right. in business. That's right, because yeah. it had uh, an auditorium large enough to seat 2,200 people, mm -hmm. and it had about 40 rooms that could be made into various types of labs and classrooms. So it wasn't bad. I mean, no, as far as that no, was it was probably and it was in the proximity of the hospital. Mm -hmm. And, uh, oh, we looked at the TP building. They yeah. had a lot of space. TP that passenger they, building. Yeah. And it would have been a good place for a downtown campus because they had a lot of flat floor space. Their elevator was at one end of the building, and then all the rest mm -hmm. of the building was open for rearrangement. Right. right. And they, uh, they made us a real interesting proposition rent-wise. Yeah. Uh, so I'm trying to think of some of the rest of the places we looked at. Uh, well, the narcotic farm. You yeah, know, the old, old narcotic farm. I was in the right process got of being, involved in that. being given away, but uh, they didn't really want to give us the whole thing. They were trying to Mickey Mouse it around for several things. And besides, we were kind of low man on the totem pole. The way that thing goes is uh, if it's federal property, uh, all the federal agencies that are interested in it, they get the first bid at it, and if they don't want it, then all the state interests, and then all the city interests, and so then only then do the private interests get to um, really have a chance to acquire a federal thing. Of course, they turned it into a prison, so the whole thing was an academic discussion. But. Uh, I think we finally ended up by starting out on the fifth floor of Fort Worth Osteopathic Hospital, who were the only people that really, in the final analysis, welcomed us and were willing to kind of underwrite us a little bit. We really never did pay Fort Worth Osteopathic Hospital any rent for that use of that building at all. Just a paper transfer. It was a paper <laughs> transfer, and a lot of people don't realize how much help that hospital has been to underwrite it. The loan was just absolutely, well, yeah. it just The biggest thing tremendous. we put, put in was petitions and some air conditioners. Cost us about 12, well, air conditioners cost about 6,000, mm -hmm. or 12, somewhere around 6,000, and it cost about 12,000 to remodel it, so mm -hmm. $18,000 is about what we had invested in. Mm -hmm. And we used it for two years, almost three years, right. in fact. And then we came into the bowling alley building, which uh, came on the market, and and uh, we were fortunate to get it. I, uh, when I heard about it, I talked to a fellow at a party one night right before the Colonial Golf Tournament, and he said, well, these people want to get rid of it. They're paying their way with it, but they want to get rid of it. But he said, don't you go talk to them. Let me go get them to talk to you. And he did, which was a, a very good idea because if we'd have got interested, why well, the price would have evolved. Right. So we were then very fortunate to get the Carter Foundation to uh, agree to underwrite the first year's rent on the building. And when we were moving into that building and had to make a three-year commitment and had a telephone hookup among the board of trustees to of the college to agree to make this commitment, I did not tell the uh, trustees that I had that commitment for the first year's rent until after they had agreed to take the plunge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was that was on the advice of Mr. Worst. Don't tell them you got the money. Let them make the decision and see what they want to do about it. Right. Then after they had made the decision, I said, Well, that's fine. We got enough money for the first year's rent already pledged to us. 
And when we rehabilitated that building and uh, um, made uh, stadium type classrooms and other facilities out of it and then had the state convention in Fort Worth the next spring and brought those people out there from the convention in buses for a cocktail party they were amazed at what a nice facility the bowling alley was in turn. And ultimately, of course, we outgrew it, but um, by that time then we had an arrangement with North Texas State to use some of their facilities for a couple of years, which led to our ultimate permanent agreement with them. I think of two more possible uh, uh, locations uh, for the school back in, at that time when we were looking, or I can think of three, come to think of it. Uh, one uh, obvious that I've overlooked is, you know, we had uh, some uh, interest manifested uh, with the Board of Trustees or Board of Directors of the Fort Worth Christian College, you remember, out in North yes, Tarrant County. out there near Glenview Hospital. We went out and looked at that thing, and they badly wanted to rent us a whole building out there. Right. But uh, it was out of our flight pattern and all, but right. we really didn't want to, um, I, I really think that they would have sold us the whole doggone college if we had the wherewith, right. but uh, it, it was too far away from our volunteer teaching personnel and all. And if we, That's we, the thing that most people overlook too, yeah, Dr. Lubel. They, they couldn't understand that the great bulk of the volunteer support was coming from people associated with Fort Worth Osteopathic Hospital. That all of the extra support, as great as it was, and that people came from Tyler and Dallas and all around the, the state and San Angelo even, and came in and gave their time and all, but while that was all necessary and all, it still was additional help, and it still wasn't the hardcore uh, day in and day out thing that the people in the immediate vicinity of Montgomery Street provided. And so, uh, and then of course you still have to get back to the fact that the Board of Medical Examiners in their ruling said that if you are going to be, if your graduates are going to be approved to take their examination, they have to be in close proximity to a 200-bed hospital. And the only 200-bed hospital we have was on the corner of Montgomery and Camp Bowie. Right. And the bowling alley building was uh, within a half a block of it. So we were covering all bases. You know, I at least had an opportunity to get acquainted with, at that time, I think he was the new uh, Catholic bishop here, Bishop Casada. Cus mm -hmm. I went down and visited with him. We even thought about possibly buying me or leasing or something the, the old, old Lanary. Lanary High School. Yeah. And I had a nice visit with him. Yeah. And, and another place that uh, is, stand, is still standing empty, and that's the old Fort Worth public uh, school district uh, ad building down on East Lancaster, or East... Uh, Third Street or Second? Uh, well, yeah, and well, it's on East Weatherford and Bell yeah. now. Mm -hmm. I know it's about 400 block on East Weatherford. Vicinity, so it's like. still there and mm -hmm. still standing, but... Uh, well, I think we were, and we really, they had a couple other school buildings around that were tentatively this one down here at White Settlement and, and uh, right near where that uh, Bill Martin second edition is. Mm -hmm. yeah. They were thinking of phasing that school out. And there was another small school over here uh, west of us near the freeway that was uh, actually closed down that we went and looked at. Right? But I think we were very fortunate that we were never able to acquire any of those places because we ended up with the best place for us to be. Well, it was an act of providence, mm -hmm. no question about yeah. that. Uh, Dr. Lubel, we've uh, enjoyed reminiscing on many of the memoirs of the past, and uh, 
But I'm wondering as we conclude our discussion about TCOM from its beginning, and I know that you, you've walked in the Valley of Despair many times during the early life of TCOM, but do you recall your most outstanding mountaintop experience that you may have had uh, as you look back and reflect on the memories of yesterday? Oh, I don't know. There, there were a lot of them, Ray. I think that um, um, first place when we got an agreement from the board of the hospital that we could use the fifth floor and actually open the place there, that was a big plus. Mm -hmm. And when we got funding to uh, get into the bowling alley building and have a, uh, some adequate space there in a permanent home, that was a big plus. And certainly then when we were able to get our funding, um, our, our legislative permission to fund uh, the uh, contract with the coordinating board whereby Texas, bona fide Texas students uh, could be enter TCOM with state funding, mm -hmm. or that the, what I mean to say that the coordinating board would contract with TCOM to provide so much money for uh, bonafide Texas residents to attend TCOM. That was certainly a big plus and that was the thing that really uh, put us on a rather sound financial uh, footing. As you recall, the first go around we only got $150,000 and then uh, Lord love him, Governor Briscoe um, vetoed the second half of the budget so we had to come back in a special session to ask for more and we got $300,000 I think out of them that time. Right. And then they kept upping the thing till in the last years before we uh, uh, actually became a state school we were getting about $12,000 per student mm -hmm. and uh, of course naturally we weren't taking many out of state students at that time. So we were able to control TCOMs uh, tuition to $2,000 a year, which was even then below most osteopathic colleges. Right, right. And we were actually getting more money per student for state funding than uh, Philadelphia or any other state school who were thought to be quite uh, uh, solvent and, uh, and doing well because they were getting five or $6,000 a year. Of course, I guess Michigan was getting as much as TCOM was, maybe even a little more. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, and but I suppose that probably uh, the final uh, uh, thing that capped it all off was when we uh, finally graduated our first class of DOs and got approval uh, from the State Board of Medical Examiners for them to take the examination to be qualified physicians in Texas because that was the goal we were really yeah, striving for we're all about. and that was really the climax of all our aspirations and while TCOM has gone on since then to achieve new goals and uh, new money and new buildings and new faculty and and uh, really made a greater visible impact on the uh, environment and the city and the state and uh, incidentally along the way because of all that's really made some new enemies or strengthened some old enemies <laughs> I don't know which oh, really? by, by that I mean in the allopathic field right why, I don't think any of it would have happened without some of the providential doors that were open for us along the way when everything seemed like it was darkest. So actually in the final uh, analysis, uh, I guess June 3rd, 1974 is the day that uh, is, uh, is the red letter day as it, far as it's your the red letter memory day. is concerned. It, uh, yeah, because uh, those were the first DOs to ever graduate in Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know that was something that I had heard talked about for 
uh, better than 20 years around Texas, but really this time it happened. And uh, I think that uh, 20 years from now, these people are going to be the dominant professional population in this state, if not before then. And we already saw the the big breakthrough where at El Paso, a TCOM graduate was elected as vice speaker of the House of Delegates, and that's the first elective office right. that one of them has um, have been awarded. I have to pinch myself and every now and then to realize that that's true. That's true. That's right. And that's just the beginning. Yeah. It's yeah. going to be more and more. You're going to, I think, five years from now, uh, I would I would be surprised if at least a third of the board of trustees of TLMA isn't uh, composed of TCOM graduates. And, uh, I think that's great. I think that's what we all wanted. Right. We couldn't have done it without all the graduates that uh, have come from other schools uh, out of the state. We couldn't have done it without the help of a lot of people that who will never be given credit for it and whose efforts were maybe even unknown will never be known, but uh, it's, you know, it's just something I think great that happened for the profession. I just hope that we don't uh, stumble around and, uh, and get complacent and drop the ball because we are still a minority and it's going to be a constant, ever uh, ongoing uh, a fight to maintain all the privileges we have acquired and all the rights we're due. Mm -hmm. uh, gets back to who's the author that said, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Uh, I guess a lot of philosophers have said it, but yeah. I forget who it's generally right. accredited to. Right. But the price of liberty for the osteopathic profession is eternal vigilance. And if we get feeling prosperous, why well, uh, we're going to get in trouble. Dr. Luba, we're certainly indebted to you for sharing with us your memoirs of your association with the Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine as its founding president, a member of its board of directors for some seven or eight years before it did become a state uh, entity. And again, we thank you very, very much. Well, Ray, it's been pleasant to remember some of those things and actually recall some things I hadn't thought of for quite a while. I <laughs> thought.